I want to acknowledge the OCLC Research Library Partnership, which both underwrites and inspires our work. Attendees of this webinar are from the OCLC RLP, and we want to thank you for your continued support and input into our work. Um, uh, and so, uh, with no further ado, um, I would like to uh, uh, introduce our uh, presenters, Scott Young, Sarah Mannheimer, and Jason Clark, all from Montana State University. And I'm going to turn things over to Scott, who will kick things off for us. Take it away, Scott. All right, thanks, Marilyn. Um, can you hear me right now? Absolutely. Okay, great. Um, so my name is Scott Young. Um, I'm here today with Sarah Mannheimer and Jason Clark. We're from Montana State University, and we're talking today about achieving privacy in the age of analytics, uh, some skills, strategies, and ethical approaches. Um, and we're happy to be talking with this group today, the OCLC Research Library Partnership. So our outline for today's session, um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, some work that we've been doing, some backgrounds um, on our project. Um, a creative process that led to some new strategies and ideas that we're going to talk today about achieving privacy, um, some specific outcomes, um, and then where we think we can head together as a community. Um, then we've got some ideas um, for discussion um, that hopefully we can we can all come together around at the end of the hour. Those questions that that we have on our mind that we we'd like to prompt some of your thinking with. Um, what are the key barriers to privacy action as you see them? Um, we're going to outline a series of what we're calling pathways to action. Um, so when we get to that later in the session, um, tune into that and think about which pathways look the most promising. Um, we'll also link to our project site um, shortly, and we've got more information there. And then um, thinking specifically about community involvement and engagement, how could you see yourself or your organization getting involved further in turning some of these pathway ideas into action. Um, so we're going to come back to these questions at the end. Okay, so where are we coming on this? Um, well, we start from the place of recognizing that libraries need web analytics. Um, we're not really saying that libraries shouldn't use web analytics, just that maybe we can use them in a smarter way. Because the usage measurements and the statistics generated from web tracking software, they do help us tell a story of value and impact for library stakeholders, including funding agencies, university administrators, or even for public libraries thinking broader community boards. Um, analytics can serve a role for tuning, tailoring, and improving services to help library users. So this is how we use analytics. Um, they are useful. Um, I'm sure a lot of us, or, or probably most of us, have some sort of analytics package installed. Maybe it's Google Analytics. Um, other ways to track how people use our collections and our services, really useful data. Um, so the flip side of this is that at the same time, we understand that users need privacy. Um, libraries have historically offered safe spaces of intellectual freedom, underpinned by a commitment to privacy in the pursuit of information. Yet the widespread implementation of commercial analytics packages, such as Google Analytics, on our websites they may cause a conflict with our profession's long-held values of privacy and intellectual freedom. So this is kind of the central problem area that, that, we, that we see, is we've implemented Google Analytics, and the way it operates is not always clear to our users or even to us. So how can we, how can we do a little bit better here in our analytics practice with a view towards privacy? And that's what led us to, to this project that we're going to focus on today, um, what we're calling a national forum on web privacy and web analytics. Um, so this was a project supported by the Institute of Museum Library Services and our home institution, Montana State University. Um, the people on the, on the project, myself, Sarah, Jason, uh, Lisa Hinchliffe, project analyst. Thank you, Lisa. Um, and then some local support, Jacqueline Frank, um, helped facilitate the forum, and David Swedman was um, a great addition as grants coordinator to the project. 
Um, here's Sarah, Jason, and me. Just a little, just a little hype up press release from our um, university news service. It's always nice when they do that. So um, the goals of our project were to critically address web analytics practices, and then to develop a roadmap um, towards a more privacy aware, values driven analytics practice in libraries. So that's kind of where we're coming from. Uh, here's our project site, um, lib.montana.edu slash privacy dashboard. Um, so there's a link in the chat now for that. You can click in there. Um, this URL has all the information about our project, what we've produced, um, who's involved. Um, so we're going to show you this URL a few more times because it's kind of our home base. Okay, so what do we do? What do we do on this project? Well, first of all, we brought together participants. Um, here they all are. There's a lot of names on that page. We brought together 40 librarians, technologists, and privacy researchers to come together to develop ideas around this question of how do we produce a more privacy-aware analytics practice. Um, this project couldn't have happened without all these participants. Um, these people are all amazing and great. Um, so thanks to everyone. Um, we started with a preform survey. We sent out a survey to the participants asking them about their thoughts on analytics and privacy, why they use analytics, how analytics and privacy can come together. Um, and we have um, uh, a, a link here um, to a data set that has the survey instrument and, and responses to the survey. So um, there's a lot of good information there. I'll just provide a very quick overview. Um, some of the things that our participants said they wanted to see was more partnerships and collaborations across um, relevant organizations working on this same problem. So lots of us in libraries want to do better here. And there's also lots of other um, organizations um, across the US and, and even the world that are um, tackling the same, the same issue. Data and Society is a good example. There's this organization called Tactical Tech in Berlin that's doing some really amazing things. Um, we wanted to focus in on privacy's relationships with equity and justice and how privacy impacts vulnerable populations. Um, we saw the value in policies and statements um, as guiding action. Um, likewise, practical guidelines. Um, a lot of times we just want um, a, like a checklist um, that say, what can I do here? Um, sort of like an educational contribution. Um, and then that leads to outreach and education models. How can we network this out? Um, and then of course, developing new analytics tools or uh, modified analytics tools. So this is kind of what the general landscape is looking like for our participants. Um, so we held this, this forum event. Um, this was the centerpiece of the project. Um, most of the IMLS funding went to support um, travel and lodging um, for our 40 participants um, on our campus um, for three days last September. Um, so all these people came to beautiful Bozeman, Montana. And, uh, and it was awesome. It was great having everyone on our, on, on our campus because Montana is a little out of the way for a lot of people. So it was cool to get a bunch of people um, together for this um, in Montana. We followed a participatory design approach um, to help generate ideas and um, evaluate and select the best strategies for moving forward. So these are some of the resources that we used. Um, game storming, 75 tools for creative thinking. And then on the right, that's uh, what's called the design method toolkit. So um, all of these resources have um, participatory exercises. We worked in small groups um, and we all developed different responses across some key theme areas that we identified. So like education and outreach, equity and justice and analytics tools, those were our main groups. Uh, um, and so through this exercise, we were able to bring everyone together to generate ideas um, in response to this this question about analytics and privacy. So I'm just gonna um, run through some quick examples of what this looked like in practice. Um, this was one example from the education and engagement group. Um, this exercise is called um, float your boat. And it uses the metaphor of the boat um, to help people identify um, strengths and weaknesses for libraries. Um, and so um, the instructions here are to draw a boat um, the boat represents privacy, education, and engagement. Um, then we ask participants to attach anchors and sails to the boat. The anchors represent obstacles and challenges in this area, and the sails represent our strengths and our aptitudes. So it's sort of like what, what 
propels us forward, but what kind of holds us down at the same time. Um, so let's zoom in on, on some of what they what they produce. And yeah, we love the creativity from the participants, like really, really awesome um, uh, imagination and, and drawing skills here. So they they recognize that the user, the, the users themselves kind of are anchors in some ways. Um, they've kind of learned to rely on convenience, helplessness even, they said, disengagement, prioritizing convenience over time. Sometimes users have low literacy or tech, technical knowledge, so that's something for us to address. Um, and then an over-reliance on, on tools or lack of holistic approach. And we could even think of ourselves in this way in some ways as the users. You know, we sometimes have over-reliance on tools and low literacy. Um, sometimes our administration can also hold us back. This was important for us to recognize. Um, sometimes uh, administration can focus on cost over other benefits or values. Um, sometimes there's a lack of knowledge um, as we go up the ladder around these issues of analytics and privacy. Um, and then, of course, competing priorities um, at higher levels, especially if we're within a context of parent institutions. Sometimes the university has uh, competing values from libraries. So that is a really interesting challenge for us to address. Um, some of the sales, some of the things that really boost us. Um, we have codes of ethics and core value statements um, from ALA, ACM, SAA. Um, lots of institutions that we are connected to um, have some strongly worded uh, values and ethics statements, which is really great for us to um, respond to. Um, and then for our users in our communities, libraries are trusted. Um, we have lots of expertise and a history of protecting users in this way. So thinking about um, leveraging that and making sure to continue that tradition. Um, and then we have uh, on the left, um, a general awareness about libraries um, and privacy within libraries. Maybe there's some increasing money for collective action. Um, that's what this group noted there. Um, we want to center users and to provide um, uh, good user experiences. Um, and then, of course, we have our, our buildings. We have our physical spaces, which are really powerful. Um, you know, people see us. They can come to us um, thinking about ways to, to use that to help, um, to help find answers in this problem area. Um, so then another example uh, of an activity that we did is once we had some ideas of, of what we wanted to do. So the float your boat exercise is just to sort of establish um, at like kind of a high level, what are our strengths and weaknesses? And then from that, we did, a we did 10 exercises total. And so the float your boat is kind of like the second or third exercise. Um, then we did this exercise called Moscow. Um, this is like the sixth or seventh exercise. So once we have some specific ideas on the table for how to leverage our sales to address our anchors, we want to have some more detail as to what that strategy looks like. So this asks people to say, um, with, with, for a specific new privacy strategy, what must that strategy have? What should it have? What characteristics shouldn't be present? What could it have? And what would we like but we won't get? So this exercise helps us get some specific characteristic detail on some higher level ideas. Um, and so here we see some awesome post-it skills. Um, each group kind of took a different approach, which is really cool. This group took this paper and created this grid and um, had all these ideas. And so we have really extensive notes for each of these ideas. Um, and then we um, went forward and did some evaluation and selection exercises and ultimately we landed on eight specific uh, strategies, which we're calling the pathways to action. We'll touch on that in a little bit. Okay, here we go. Project outcomes. And I'm gonna pass it to Jason. Hello everyone, can you hear me? Yeah. Like, perfect. Um, I'm just gonna, Sarah and I uh, are in the library and there's some construction below us. So you may hear an occasional kind of knock. That's just some pounding. Uh, happening below. Hopefully, we won't, it won't be. Uh, it, it seems like it's pretty mellow, but just wanted to acknowledge that in case people are wondering. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit more about. Uh, you saw Scott speaking to the, the data collection, the sort of facilitation, um, the uh, initiatives, and sort of our objectives with bringing people together and welcoming them into the space and building a, 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 a in a very short time a privacy community that was really engaged and wanting to share. Um, and so all of that uh, data came, came forward. And it was a matter of starting to pull that data together and start to present a narrative. And so I'm going to start talking a little bit about that. Sarah's going to talk more in more detail about the pathways after me. Um, 
hold on, I have to press here. So what we produced uh, was uh, given the grant deliverables, we talked about, a, uh, we, we produced a white paper, uh, the action handbook, which is what I'm gonna speak to in a moment, and then the eight pathways, um, which are kind of future steps and possibilities um, suggested uh, and really vetted by the community. Um, within the white paper, um, so all of this again, uh, I, I think Mary Lee already tweeted this particular URL. Um, if you go to libmontent.edu slash privacy forum, all of our docs are there. Okay, so let's leave this on the screen for a sec. I keep doing that, sorry. Um, so the, the white paper, and, and of interest to this group, uh, the, the participants, um, this is really probably a, a useful advocacy doc, document because what it does is it really provides, uh, it tries to digest a lot of that data and present a, a cohesive narrative around what we saw in the forum. Um, it might give you ideas for how you want to think about privacy in your own organization or how you might want to present privacy initiatives or goals to your administration. Um, so a fairly standard white paper uh, bringing together a, a narrative to, to explain what we did, why we did, the things we did and the things we were seeing, okay? Um, and what I'm really gonna feature, uh, talk about in my section just uh, is this, the, this idea of an action handbook. Um, I also wanna recognize Lisa Hinchliff was on the grant. She's also in the room. So um, good to see you, Lisa. She also helped us bring this data together and think uh, more broadly about what else we could do. And I believe in some of our discussions, we were talking more about um, just wanting to move beyond the, the simple narrative and the white paper to a set of uh, guidelines or a handbook that can present some recommendations for people as they're thinking about these privacy-oriented practices. Um, we also noted in this handbook that there's, obviously there are technical uh, guidelines when you're thinking about implementing analytics or software or what you do with data. But we also recognize over the course of our discussions in the forum, there's a huge social component here, right? So um, the, the handbook also mentions some ideas about organizing, building community, um, advocacy for this idea. So um, the first part, um, this is more of a technical uh, part of the handbook, but we noted that with a, a simple default uh, analytics implementation, uh, that there are potentially some, um, first of all, there, there's, a lot of, um, there's a lot of implementations that go with a default setting on Google Analytics. So one of the things, and we also noted uh, as far as market share analytics, Google Analytics is a, a primary, um, it, a, it's used in a number of our libraries. Um, and these were small to larger academics, right? Um, so one of the things we wanted to address in the handbook was an idea around how do you set up something uh, that can be public but also private, right? Like how do you honor that using a public system? And even the, you know, the software agreements as you move and use um, Google Analytics, they're, 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 there's only so far you can take it. Um, and I'm only listing, there, there were like, of the, of the top three, um, that they're actually listed on this slide when you're thinking about analytics implementation. We also tried to abstract this a bit because um, you could use these kind of principles in any kind of analytics setting. So forcing some kind of secure connection um, with that data, uh, only using the data that you need uh, within the Google Analytics, it's anonymizing the IP address, or, or it basically shaves off the last two or three digits, so you, you get a basic idea of where somebody is coming from, but you cannot identify what computer they're on. Um, and then also thinking through just the, the overhead of the snippet itself, um, and there are some examples of how to do a really minimal analytics snippet. But there are, I, I do wanna pitch, uh, there's a lot more information in the handbook around technical, this, this technical question. Um, but if you can kind of abstract those three ideas, like secure connections, 
anonymizing data to a degree, um, and in this case, an IP, um, and then also minimal uh, application of the snippets themselves. Uh, that can lead to better performance, uh, less data traveling over the wire, um, all of those factors. Uh, and, uh, we also spec out some alternative analytics, um, and this uh, I think we, this slide is from about a month or two ago, and I, this is an, a market that appears to be emerging. Um, but these, the, the ones that are listed here, are, are, are some of them uh, that are that are ready, uh, ready, also ready to de be deployed. So we just wanted to recognize that there are other ways to grab. Um, to understand uh, your analytics and your traffic. Um, and we even abstracted all the way down to server log level, um, which is really the thing that runs a lot of these analytics programs are uh, server, server logs. As, as things move uh, on, on and off of the system, there's a, a record of that. And it's raw data, but um, it's also a potential source of data that doesn't have as, or can be cleaned and anonymized. I don't know what the question is, but we can probably pick it up later. Um, so along with those, those, some of those social ideas, um, one of the things we wanted to quantify were the things we were seeing around competencies and staff skills. So things like how do you, what does it mean to prepare data? Um, where are the vulnerabilities in some of these systems? What are some core privacy concepts? So all of this is part of, um, Again, kind of recognizing that social component and also the teaching moment or the training moment for our libraries. And this is outlined again in the, the handbook itself. We also wanted to give people an idea of how, um, uh, so the, I think we, Scott and Sarah, I think we modeled this on five-star linked data. Uh, we were thinking through sort of, um, Ideas around how would you quantify different levels of uh, indi indicate a privacy level, like what level your organization is at, or uh, how do you? Yeah, that's basically what it was. Um, so what we did is we we drafted out some ideas around um, what does it mean to be at, at a level a level three with your analytics tools. Um, and that might include there's a data retention strategy, uh, but also the right to be forgotten, uh, the, the right to remove data um, as necessary. So this, uh, really the goal here was to help people understand that there, you can start somewhere and you maybe you only get to a level two, but at least you're able to understand, oh yeah, I feel like I can, I can say that our, our organization is at this kind of level. Um, it also allows you to, to make a case to uh, people in your organization about the need to do more work, um, to, to convey to administration where you are in terms of privacy within your organization. I'm going to actually hand it uh, back to you, Sarah, who's going to talk through more of the pathways and, and set up our future steps. Hi, um, thanks Jason and Scott and Marilee. So I will be talking through the eight um, pathways to action that the participants in the forum came up with through all of those participatory activities. Um, so here they are, there's a privacy certification idea, an analytics dashboard idea, some leadership training modules, uh, privacy as it relates to tribal organizations, a model license for um, to use with vendors, a research institute, policy workshops, and an assessment toolkit. So first, the privacy certification. This idea was um, that we would have a certification system that establishes sort of um, stratified data privacy standards for libraries and their information vendors that can be actually marked on a website. So it's inspired by something like the LEED certification where you can have like a green, a silver, a gold, or a platinum, and you can see as it goes along um, kind of how well you're doing. It relates back sort of to those privacy indicators that Jason was talking about. 
but it's just a, an at a glance that someone can come to your website and say, this is how this institution is doing privacy wise. Uh, the next idea was an analytics dashboard. Um, so this would be a lightweight framework and dashboard that only show you the necessary data points. A lot of our focus was about um, collecting data, but collecting the right data, the, only the data that we need. So this would be, uh, this would allow people to implement that dashboard um, to show our value using just the data we need. Um, the next one is leadership training. So this idea was that we would take advantage of systems already in place um, for higher up people and create an ethics and equity focused model that could be added into leadership training um, like the Leading Change Institute or other leading leadership institutes. So the idea is that instead of privacy coming from grassroots, we, we train leaders and help them um, understand the importance of this so that they can um, advocate for privacy from a higher level. Um, tribal organizations, we had several participants who worked at tribal organizations and so, or at tribal libraries. And so they talked about some of the specific needs in a tribal community about privacy and surveillance. Um, so they worked through some of these ideas, um, thinking how tribal organizations can implement culturally appropriate web analytics and web privacy practices. Uh, next, a model license. This is the idea that we would have model licensing language that we could provide to vendors when we were negotiating vendor um, contracts that would promote privacy in their third party systems. Um, that could be shared among the library community and everyone could sort of insert it in and through that sort of collective action of language uh, we would help promote privacy even with third-party systems. The Research Institute is sort of a think tank idea it's that we would support evidence-based privacy advocacy um, and this is a quote from their materials redefining metrics in a way that redefines success um, and this would be an inter-institutional institute where people could come together and create some of that evidence to help support uh, privacy across our communities. Um, privacy policy workshops. This is an idea, um, the policy, the privacy policy you have on your website is an important part um, like that, how libraries put their privacy ideas out there. And the idea is that um, these workshops would allow privacy employees uh, to write and implement policies that are clear and understandable for, um, for our users. And Lisa was on this group and um, I know she just got an IMLS grant. It's, it's somewhat related to these workshops, but it's um, I think broader and maybe she could tell us a little bit about that after. Um, assessment toolkit. I think this is the last one, yeah. So this is the idea that um, it, you could create an actual tool um, that you could use to implement privacy aware and user conscious assessment. Um, this sort of has to do with those who are collecting the data. We talked about that dashboard that would only show the data that was necessary. This is about only collecting the data that's necessary, thinking about what assessment metrics we need to tell our story and exactly what data we need to gather um, to tell that story. So I think now I turn it back to Scott to discuss some future direction. Scott, you may be muted. Thank you, there we go, I think we're back. Yes. Okay, so where where does this all um, point towards? Uh, let's talk about where we think we can go together. Um, okay, so our project team wants to facilitate the realization of one or more of these pathways. So the specific project ideas that Sarah just outlined, uh, plus the recommendations from the action handbook. Um, so we want to help our 
community implement these ideas. Um, so improve the analytics practice through the action handbook and then start to ask some bigger questions through the pathways. Uh, and we recognize that this is um, a community will require community effort um, to achieve these community goals. Um, they're pretty big. They're pretty big. Um, once again, here is our project website. Um, so much information there. Um, we also have a project site on OSF that has um, some additional data. Um, and the OSF light, uh, site is also linked from the privacy form site. Um, but those are two, two key places um, to check out for more information. Uh, here's what our website looks like. Um, so here's what you'll see when you go there. Um, two main uh, points of entry into the white paper and the action handbook. Um, and then we have overviews of um, each of the eight pathways. Um, so take a look at those. Um, so yeah, so we're going to take a turn now to what it looks like to take action um, in your context and then for us uh, as a broader community. Um, that's kind of that's kind of where we're headed, actually. Um, so we have these discussion questions. Um, so we just want to talk with you more about um, responses to this work and um, ideas for um, barriers and opportunities in terms of um, moving, keeping this work moving forward. Um, so that's what we have for you today. Um, we'll say thank you for your time, um, and and let's let's try to have a little discussion around these around these questions um, or others that that you may have. Great, thank you, thank you so much to all of you for and to your um, extended team, the people who attended the forum for uh, for producing such um, thought provoking and helpful. Uh, materials uh, that will hopefully lead us into some sort of discussion. WebEx is not the, the best venue for discussion, but we'll, we'll work with us. Uh, and then also the OCLC Research Library Partnership would like to um, try to have some smaller facilitated group discussions where people can actually talk to one another. So we'll be following up uh, and uh, see if there's interest in, in organizing um, some of those after this webinar. We do have a couple of questions um, uh, that have come in through chat. So just again to remind you, if you're sending something into chat, please be sure that the uh, option is set to all participants. Um, so here's a question about uh, Google Analytics. So if you use that kind of minimal implementation of Google anim anal Analytics, does that minimize all of what Google knows about your uh, your um, resources, the patron, et cetera? So I, I'm, I, I'm kind of interpreting here that does this keep Google from knowing or does it prevent you from getting uh, information that, that you know, you respecting, the library respecting uh, the patron, um, you, you see where I'm going with that? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a tricky question because um, our, our library has worked um, on Google-related services for about, you know, at least five years really solidly. And one of the key takeaways, you know, we've worked on like, um, SEO, um, Knowledge Card, Wikipedia, Analytics. Um, one of the one of the things that is really um, challenging with Google is you're never you're never quite sure. Um, you know they post some guidelines and documentation, um, but but they're you know because of their sort of secrets, we're never quite sure how things work uh, or really which services are talking to each other. So. There's some really interesting research coming out of computer science that is trying to understand how these trackers um, collect data and how they share data between them. Because um, the Google Analytics tracker is just one of literally thousands of trackers um, that, that collect data and then together combine to create like a single profile of you. And it's all in support of um, uh, ad targeting uh, in, in this instance. And so that's kind of a kind of a bummer really but um but it's 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 hard to say it's hard to say um i guess is like the short answer um because even with the ip anonymization you know that is a privacy feature that google implements um 
but what that actually looks like on their back end is unverified. Um, so, so that's that's a tough one. You know, we sort of have stepped into our recommendations in the Action Handbook, and it kind of starts with Google Analytics in the thinking that if you find yourself needing to use Google Analytics, we've got some recommendations for that. Um, but we also want to try to open up our thinking to a sort of a post Google Analytics world. What does that look like? Um, and Jason mentioned that there are lots of new companies competing in this space now. Um, they're not just handing over the market, so to speak, to Google on this. Um, so that creates opportunities um, for us. So if there is any sort of motivation at your local setting, um, or if the work of this forum can help build the motivation um, to take a critical look at Google Analytics and maybe maybe install something else. Um, so, so yeah, Jason or Sarah, what, what what else do you think on that on that question? This is Jason. I think you covered a lot of it. I, Jim's question is also related to. So there's um, whatever you minimize. I I do think we saw. So what. Google actually records and what gets pushed back to the analytics interface. Um, as you start to minimize, there are things that don't work as well. Like location, if you start to anonymize the IP a bit more, that the ability to do location tracking and understand that parts of, you get a more general picture of that in the analytics interface because the data is not there. At least as they're re representing that data back to you, what they record raw or, I mean, that's kind of that big what if question that, that Scott is right to, to put his thumb on. Um, but there are, there are short, uh, I don't want to call them shortcomings. There's little, uh, the interface itself, the analytics interface gets, um, it doesn't have as much information in it because it, it doesn't really, uh, as they're representing it back to you, it doesn't have that information. So like ad tracking and user behavior, some of those are a little, um, they're not as complete, but here's the great, I think one of our eye-opening uh, realizations is that even with that, it's still plenty of data, right? And let's get that one of those core questions we were coming at during the, the, the forum. What, just collect the data you need to, and you can still be, you can still have an understanding of general locations, you can still have a general understanding of how people are moving into your site, um, what are common user behaviors, what are common referrers. Um, so you get enough data, right? You just, you don't need everything. And that default setting is just so, it's so inclusive that um, I think one of the, the early recognitions for us is like, we don't need all of this. Like we, we get enough if we minimize the snippet. The snippet also, Jim, as you uh, minimize it, um, you get a, a better performance. It takes a lot at times to load. They've optimized it as best they can, but sometimes it can be a drag on your page load. Um, so the minimization helps there as well. That's not really data collection, but that's more of a user experience. Is that helpful, Scott? Sarah? Yeah, yeah, I think that's great. Yeah, making the point that the default Google Analytics implementation, it collects so much data, you know, it's way more than we need in libraries to tell our story. Uh, you know, it's an e-commerce tool um, developed to help companies make decisions about, you know, the buy now buttons on their website, so to speak. So, um, so thinking about tuning down Google Analytics for just what we need, um, and that's one of the critical questions that, um, that we want to encourage people to think about is, um, what are you collecting, what data are you collecting that you don't need? Um, and the, the, the idea of, uh, you know, collecting data that you might need in the future, um, it just, that, that sort of practice creates a lot of liability, um, you know, data liability, privacy liability, um, and just maintenance over time, because then that's just that much more data to, um, to sort through um, that you don't even know if you'll use. So um, sort of thinking critically about just the, the starting assessment question, so to speak, like what, what questions are you trying to answer, and then what data do you need? Um, Google Analytics kind of starts in the other direction. It's like, we'll give you all this data, and then decide what questions you want to ask. And it's, it's a little backwards. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple more questions. Just uh, to remind people, we've got these discussion cues, but also 
um, please feel free to ask additional questions since we've got our expert panel here. Um, here's a question. Do you have an example of a redefined metric that led to redefined success? Kind of building off of that, um, that, that uh, probing into Google Analytics and, and what do you really need? That's a great question. Um, and I looked at our project notes um, from that group and I'm going to drop into the chat um, some of the um, responses that they had to that. Um, so what they included in the notes were, um, why do we think that tracking users is a way for measuring value success? That's a really interesting, just base level critical question. Um, why do we think it's useful to talk about library value in terms of, for example, graduation rate? Um, others were uh, student retention, GPA, um, are those those sort of university level metrics that we're tying our success to? Um, what are some other success measures? Um, you know, is that like some of our participants focused in on the, the possibility that tying our success to those measures is, it, it may not even be possible just given all the variables present on campus, um, but even if it was possible, is that how we want to define our value? Um, and so questions like return on investment um, are, are those questions driving our analytics practice? And is that leading us to um, making decisions about privacy that are maybe against our values? Um, and then um, why do analytics themselves drive so much of how we frame the debate around success and, um, and privacy? So, oh, and then this last one, imp um, empirical evidence to the idea that students don't care about privacy. This was a very interesting one. And in fact, um, after the forum, um, uh, occurred, there was an IMLS grant that uh, Kyle Jones and some others are a part of called Data Doubles. Um, and so they're actually um, trying to build empirical evidence to, to answer that exact question. Um, how do students care about privacy? Uh, so it looks like they're going to have some really interesting results um, in the coming months. Uh, so yeah, those are some examples that, that the participants um, came up with in response to that. Great. Um, there's another question I'm seeing here, uh, and I'm not sure that I understand the question. Maybe one of you does and can help unpack this for anybody else who, like me, is not familiar with this. Has anyone been working on privacy implications with cross-domain cross versus single property? I'm not aware of anyone for that specific thing. I think I'm interpreting that to mean um, like if you have multiple subdomains, like for example, in our library website, we have um, right. lib.montana.edu, and then we have for our lib guides, guides.lib.montana.edu. So for users crossing those subdomains um, versus if you just keep everyone on the same, the same URL. Um, I, I'm not aware of anything specific um, on that question. Okay, um, super. I am going to um, take back the controls here for a second because I thought I would move us um, to slide 48. Um, which it also looks like there was one more. What are your barriers to privacy action locally? Or is that, was that a question? No, that's a question for me. That was a question for me just kind of trying to um, uh, trying to prompt people um, into answering the question. But I just thought I would bring up this slide because it listed out all the pathways to action. Uh, one of the other discussion prompts were, was uh, which pathways to action do you think are, are, are most, uh, most fruitful or most um, likely to dig in? So I thought, I just thought I'd move to this slide. Um, sure. Uh, so Jim um, has kind of a, a comment, I think, um, 1990s, recall that future market investors uh, used to come to the library for any agriculture de developments to decide on uh, future market investments. Um, Google could do the same for new research trend or jumpstart a clone research group or sell hot research trends to pub public, to private companies. Um, getting the jump on your patrons based on your patron search. Yeah, certainly that's something that we uh, uh, leave ourselves open to 
um, when using a, a proprietary product where we don't know um, where where all that's going. Mm -hmm. um, just based on uh, you know kind of uh, ripping on the um, what are what are barriers to getting uh, to taking some action, I'll just say for for myself, I think that some of my barriers are just kind of lack of awareness um, and lack of tools to be able to dig in. Um, so at your uh, at your at your workshop, um, I, I assume that that a lot of uh, the tools that you've developed are kind of in in response to being giving people those those pathways and those those clues to be able to follow to be able to take some specific action along those lines. Yeah. Yeah, even just awareness of, um, of Google Analytics, for sure. Um, yeah. That's, that's yeah. a good starting point. Yeah, and I, I would say that uh, minimizing Google Analytics seems, uh, for me at least, to be a, a, a fruitful uh, starting point because it just, even understanding what Google Analytics is showing you, if you had a more minimal view, it would really help you be able to zero in and see the data that you want to be able to see as opposed to seeing all of it. So it would actually make Google Analytics more functional uh, because you're, you're less likely to be chasing down the questions that aren't actually relevant to you. Yeah, that's you a really good have point. That sell button. Yeah, because the, the minimal analytics, it, it, it serves in some ways two purposes. The one is to try to reduce the amount of data collection in the first place. But even if there's still a lot of data being collected, like um, if you layer on like a minimal analytics view on top of Google Analytics, part of it is to help sort of train ourselves um, to see and understand what uh, less analytics looks like um, and to demonstrate that it's still um, as useful as we need it to be. Um, so it, it is kind of like a self-training tool as well. Um, and then we could also use it to show um, administrators um, that a minimal analytics approach can still answer some of the questions, um, some of the questions that we have. Okay, super. I'm not seeing um, uh, any any questions in chat right now. I wonder if um, either uh, my either of my OCLC colleagues, Mercy or Chela, have any questions that they've been um, holding on to. Um, I'll also just. Uh, mention again that we are hoping to uh, have some uh, more facilitated conversations following up on this webinar, uh, particularly after people have had an opportunity to dig into some of these pathways and to reflect on um, some of the excellent materials that you guys have record, uh, made available in your in your project site. But um, I do have a question. Um, I'm sort of about the scope of the project, and um, and certainly I could read all your documents, and this would help me answer it. But since I've got you here, um, I, did you focus primarily on the the data that the library is collecting, or did you think at all about the data that the vendors that we send people to are collecting, like publishers' databases and stuff? Um, when we when we kind of link them out into the world and and what happens once they leave the library website proper. Sarah, do you want to take this one? Sure. I would say that it, it did come up, but most of our pathways involve um, the library itself. I'd say the closest thing we got to that was our model license language which tries to sort of, through our license agreements with third-party vendors, um, help bring them more into line with our library values. But it's a really good point. I mean, information comes from so many different sources. It's not just our databases that we direct our patrons to. And so, um, I, I, you know, like something like our privacy policy and education modules could also help with that, but I think you're hitting on like a major, kind of a major downer that happened during the forum, which was everyone 
we were excited about all of our ideas that were coming forward, but we also just saw the enormity of the problem and just like how systemic our privacy um, infraction infringements are um, all over the online world. So yeah, I feel like, I mean, that's part of what's so cool about these pathways to action is in in a way, these are like a, a research agenda that we're putting forth into the community and saying, like, work on these. <laughs> yeah. And so it's like there are all these all these problems, additional problems that come up as we even continue to work on these um, these issues we have at hand. Great. Sorry, I didn't mean to be a bummer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean it's it's a very interesting question. <laughs> um, Scott and Jason, anything to add? No, that's great. Yeah, thank you. You captured it. And following up on that, Lisa has added in chat um, uh, that she is pursuing the model license project, which would relate uh, directly to this um, and trying to find funding for that. So um, uh, be in touch with her if you're interested in, in working on that as an important topic. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I am not seeing any other questions uh, at the moment. So. Um, I just want to remind people this, this webinar has been um, uh, recorded and we will be um, uh, sending you a link to both the recording and, uh, and the slides. Uh, and of course all of those rich links so that you can dig in um, and get some, some more information. Um, I want to thank our, our presenters for bringing together so much rich material on what is definitely an important topic for, for libraries and also uh, for, for providing some uh, fodder for uh, continued discussion and hopefully action. So thank you so much to the um, MSU team. And um, uh, this concludes today's webinar. Thank you. Thanks, Larry.